Okay, so the next speaker is Dr. Ralph Eidolf. Um, he's the past director of the Caltech Brain Imaging Center and chair of Caltech's Institutional Review Board, and also the director of the Caltech's Contest Center for the Neurobiology of Social Decision Making. <clears throat> uh, his laboratory investigates the underpinnings of human social behavior with a long term focus on emotion, the amygdala, and autism. Um, and an ultimate conceptual goal of his work is to understand how descriptions of human, uh, sorry, no, I got lost, uh, of human social behavior at the level of psychology and psychiatry arise from neuronal processing at the cognitive systems and circuit level. For this, he's doing research from single cell recordings in neurosurgical uh, surgical patients, fMRI in both healthy and clinical populations, up to large scale behavioral studies. Um, so let's welcome Dr. Ralph Adolf. I'm going to hand this over. You're not using the other one. Okay. I'll try speaking into this. If I fade out or the Zoom people can't hear me, let me know and I can put the lapel mic on. Uh, thanks, Alex, for the intro. Thanks, David and co-organizers for inviting me to speak here and putting all this together. And uh, thanks to Boston University for hosting it and the Chen Institute for, uh, for helping it along. So here's one way that um, Alan already set up for you of thinking about uh, the mind, uh, psychology broadly. Uh, in terms of states and traits. So if you take a set of measured variables that's shown up here, this is actually data from the Human Connectome Project. And most of you are probably familiar with that data set. It's over a thousand participants or so on whom there are behavioral measures, questionnaires, cognitive performance tasks, and of course, MRI. And usually people look at you know, functional connectivity matrices or something from MRI. What this is from those thousand or so subjects from the Human Connectome Project, is the correlation matrix across those thousand subjects of behavioral variables, how they are rated the, the NEO, various personality scales, cognitive tasks, and questionnaires about how, how good or bad they felt. Um, and you can see that there's you know, structure in this, which is what you would expect. So the, the hot colors are positive correlations, the blue ones are anti-correlations. And so as you would expect, all the scales that assess how anxious or depressed you are, are positively correlated with one another and the anti-correlated with the positive ones uh, here. And here, if you do well on one kind of performance task, you do well on another, the so-called positive manifold uh, from which you could derive uh, Spearman's G, a measure of general intelligence. So there's structure, there's relations between these. And one way of thinking about what psychologists uh, uh, put into boxes and arrows in this architecture here is that you could think of this on the right, this is just a toy example, this is not a solution to this, as a, uh, a model, a generative model that's supposed to explain uh, these measured variables, right? So you would have the states, these ones here, you would have traits in this simplified version here, and then you would have the measured variables that are caused, uh, caused by these. So that's, that's one way of thinking about it. You would have temporally stable variables, the traits up here that distinguish individuals from one another, but are stable throughout time. And then you would have states that vary depending on particular environmental and contextual factors. And eye movements reflect both of these and autism uh, reflects both of these. And here's one example from data that we, that we collected recently unpublished as of yet, uh, that makes the point that indeed eye movements, eye tracking, uh, is heritable. Uh, I guess I can just start it and uh, talk while it's going on. Uh, so these are, these are over 100 or so pairs of children, teenagers, who watched this video up here, and you can see their eye tracking data over here. These are also just different versions of the same data that you can ignore. So each black dot here is one participant, and you can see that there is there are lots of state variables that drive the correlation in their gaze. So if there's a face, everybody looks at the face, for instance. Um, what's shown at the bottom here, and this, this uh, horizontal line moving across is time, is the correlation as a function of breaking down these um, participants in terms of identical twins, fraternal in red, fraternal twins in blue, and genetically unrelated pairs of children in gray. And you can see that there's a strong heritable effect in the sense that uh, the, the monozygotic twin pairs look more similarly at, these, uh, at, at this video than do the dizygotic ones 
who, and who look more similarly than the genetically unrelated ones. This is, this is more detail on what other people like Ami Klin and John Constantino already published some time ago uh, in relation uh, to autism, actually, in this particular nature paper. But they showed that this is already stable in very young children, in toddlers, where if you have one particular twin and you quantify heat maps or looking at a face or in this particular figure, the proportion that a particular uh, child looks or toddler looks at the eyes in an image and you have their twin, you see that there's a strong positive correlation for identical twin pairs. So if my twin is down here and doesn't look much at the eyes, then neither do I. If my twin looks at the eyes a lot in stimuli, then so do I, so it's heritable. And it's less heritable, it's, it's less, there's less of a correlation in the dizygotic ones and even less so in the unrelated individuals. And here are the intra-class correlations that just quantify that. So all of these studies, including our own work and, and lots of work by others has shown that uh, eye movements, eye tracking, as both state and trait features, and it's certainly heritable, and as such, uh, can be used to gain some insight um, into autism. And so we looked at this in this particular paper here. Uh, these are static, I don't know, actually, these are videos also that we showed participants. There's more information on this than, uh, than we need to talk about. But if you look, for instance, sticking with the eyes, if you quantify how an individual, each dot here is one individual participant, Autism is red, uh, typically developed control participants are in blue. And if we quantify across a video, the a proportion of time that a particular individual spends looking to the eyes when they watched one video, a particular episode of the sitcom, The Office, on one visit. And then we take that same individual and we ask how much time they spend looking at the eyes in a different uh, uh, office uh, episode on a different testing date, you find that there's a strong positive correlation. Some uh, participants tend not to look at the eyes, some look at the eyes a lot, and those are stable trait-like individual differences that we find both in autism and in the control participants. And of course, there's group differences as well, which you can probably eyeball here, at least with respect to the eyes, the well-known difference that, that uh, typically developed participants look more at the eyes in faces than do um, autistic uh, participants. But the point is that there are stable trait-like differences here that we can pull out uh, with eye tracking. And so these are the, the questions that have driven um, our work here. So you already heard uh, about autism from, from Joy and from, from Alan. Uh, it's a pervasive developmental disorder, which means uh, that you can't get it as an adult. You're born with it, and it's lifelong. And as you know, it's diagnosed, and it's widely acknowledged that it's a very broad uh, spectrum, and in particular, on all variables, uh, uh, it, Autistic participants have a very broad range that overlaps with typically developed individuals. And so these are the, the sort of guiding questions uh, for work in our lab. What measures or features should we use to best classify autism if you post if, if you pose it as a, as a supervised classification problem? So you take the, the blue ribbon diagnosis, DSM-5 or ADOS or whatever you have, and you ask, are there brain measures that allow you to classify autism? Are there um, eye tracking features? And which features are the most uh, predictive of, of whether or not somebody has autism or not? So we're working on that. Um, uh, going back to Andrew's talk, one, one big question is with respect to eye tracking data, what metrics or features of the eye tracking data should be used? You know, blinks, pupil dilation, you have you know, these transition matrices and much more complicated temporal features. Should, if we feed all of those into a big classifier, which ones actually do most of the work? Then this one that Alan alluded to, and, it, it, and I think everybody agrees these days, you know, the, the DSM-5 is a bunch of psychiatrists achieving consensus on how to come up with a classification scheme. Can we improve on that, right? And so this is, I think, a, a big and complicated question. Can we revise the diagnostic criteria given the, given the eye tracking data in particular, and I think completely revised, if you, you know, think of it in a completely unsupervised way. So Alex actually talked about this in his talk, right? So you could have canonical correlation or ICA, and you, you're completely blind to the diagnosis, right? If I just put autism and typically developed participants together, um, what do you get? And the answer often is, well, you might get something that bears no resemblance to your original classification, and, and then what? Uh, so th th there's a problem of how to interpret that. 
So we, we would probably take what we've been doing so far is taking the diagnosis, the DSM diagnosis or ADOS, and then asking within that, there's this huge heterogeneity. Can we find subgroups? Can we, can we account for individual differences in a parametric way? Uh, and then ultimately, of course, we want to link that to uh, not just neuro. When people talk about mechanisms, and I think everybody here tends to think of biology and the brain, but I don't think you need to. You could perfectly well have a purely psychological story that also gives you the mechanisms in terms of processes, how well they map onto the brain, uh, I tend to think may actually be misguided in some cases. So I always tell people in my lab, don't start with fMRI, start with behavior, and only if it really makes sense, go to the biology. But in, in any case, mechanisms of some kind, which is basically a causal explanation of whatever subtypes or individual differences we account for, um, that would allow ultimately intervention of some kind. Um, skip this. So the, the basic finding in the literature and across these papers that we've published and people other than, than ourselves have published way, way more on this um, is the one that you're familiar with, which is if you compare typically developed controls to autistic participants in terms of how they gaze onto faces, they gaze less at the eyes. So red here is where controls are greater than autistic participants and blue conversely. It, it, it depends on the state. So there's a trait propensity for autistic individuals not to fixate the eyes, but it depends on what the stimuli are, if they're real people, if they're pictures of faces on a computer and on the context and the task. So it's certainly very context dependent. Um, but that's, the, that, that's one basic finding. However, if you look at raw data, so each colored circle here is the direction of face of one participant in a group of controls, autistic participants matched in relevant variables. Um, watching this, this uh, sitcom that we used a lot in our uh, studies as a stimulus, The Office, it's extremely difficult to know how to analyze that and certainly just pouring uh, at it with your own visual system uh, is hard. Here's a quantification of it. And so you can quantify in red and orange uh, the direction of gaze of autistic participants and blue typically developed controls. And here again is a, is a time um, bar moving across accelerated up here that just plots the correlation between all these subjects. And you find at some points, you know, there are the autistic participants come apart and diverge more. Uh, and at some point, the typically developed ones. And then, of course, you would like to know, well, what's happening at that point in the video? What's what features are driving, driving this and accounting for it? So to decompose this, what we've done is um, is basically do you know, the full version of what Andrew mentioned to you. So you can decompose a complex stimulus, in this case, a movie frame by frame into all the features, pixel-wise, object-wise, semantic. A lot of that can be done in an automated way. For some of it, you have to get ratings. But so here's, here's one story that we found that, that makes a couple of points. If you simply look at a very low-level feature, which is contrast, you find that you know, the lights and the white shirts of the person and various things have contrast. And you if you ask, where do people tend to look, you find that uh, autistic participants are more attracted to look at high contrast regions in these videos than other typically developed controls. But as you can see here, even though there's a group mean difference that's statistically significant, if you choose to do standard statistics on this, there's a huge overlap. And in fact, the group difference is driven pr primarily by a few autistic participants that are kind of outliers. So one conclusion you might say, well, if I only had a larger sample, it might turn out this is a subgroup of autism that's actually driving this particular kind of effect. So you can you can go sort of uh, not not all the way, but you can you can expand on this, uh, which people have done. Uh, so this is work from Shi Zhao and uh, colleagues uh, down at the University of, of uh, Minnesota. You can take images and annotate them for every for all the different features. So all the brightness and contrast, different objects and different semantic labels, which typically uh, people need to do. Is there something emotional or attractive or interesting, whatever semantic labels you have. And you can build a model of where people tend to fixate when they view these from eye tracking data that assigns feature weights like what's shown here. So this is from a whole bunch of uh, actually probably college students or MTurkers or something um, that quantifies each of these features. And a lot of them make sense and would be in line with what you already know. So for instance, people tend to look a lot at faces. So face features have a high weight, 
We tend to look a lot at text. And in general, for at least these kinds of visual images, uh, typical, typical participants tend to be driven most by semantic meaningful uh, features rather than merely by pixel level uh, contrast or something like that. So, and what we found a couple of years ago using the same kind of approach and comparing typically developed participants to those with autism in, in blue and red respectively here, it's, it's what's, what's shown here. So fixation order or times on the x-axis. And we find that people with autism are more attracted to look at low level features like what I already showed you. And that, uh, that is accentuated actually over, over time when they look at an image and less attracted to look at um, semantic features. In this particular paper, we annotated a lot. We had a lot of semantic features, not just faces. And we found this effect to be uh, global, non-specific. So it wasn't the case that people with autism tended not to look at faces. They tended not to look at any semantic object level feature uh, and instead were more attracted to low level features. So one, one big question, uh, you know, I think in the, in the field, uh, with respect to everyday neuroscience is, is there something domain specific about social, real social people, or is this just derivative to attention, arousal, or other nonspecific um, factors? Okay, so finally turning to um, the, the original title of my talk. So this is work we've just completed and are just starting to do. Um, respectively with respect to smartphones and webcams. And so if you have input, or are interested in collaborating or any of these studies, we haven't actually even started the webcam one. Uh, there was some talk about funding. You will see that NIH is not represented here. Uh, Caltech ha also has a Chen Institute, uh, which is uh, helping to pull together all the neuroscience um, at Caltech. But then these particular studies, the webcam one is funded by the Simons Foundation and the smartphone one is funded by Google. So you could imagine industry and private foundations being the way to go for everyday neuroscience rather than um, NIH. And these are the two people that did all the work, or most of the work, a postdoc, Nayeon Kim, and a graduate student, Chen Wu. Um, and here's uh, more contact information for them. So for the uh, Pixel phones, Google had figured out and published a few years ago uh, that you could use Google Pixel phones that had sort of black box Google proprietary algorithms in them to actually do fairly high resolution eye tracking with a spatial resolution uh, approaching about half a centimeter um, and maybe 20 Hertz or so temporal resolution. And that could be used to actually do feature-based eye tracking to videos um, and, and other stimuli. And so here's what we found in that uh, study. Uh, here's uh, the uh, error that we have comparing autism in, in orange and controls in blue um, on the phone when it's used in the lab and it's used in the participant's home compared to a Toby eye tracker. And the bottom line is it's quite good. It's quite acceptable. The problem, of course, is the screen of the phone is small. So this dotted line here is the size, I think it's the size that a head in the, in the videos that we used subtends on the screen of the Pixel phone and on the, uh, on the monitor uh, with the Toby eye tracker. So it's much larger on the monitor for typical study than Toby eye tracker. And so you have much better spatial resolution just because you have a bigger monitor. Um, but it's, it's, it's sufficiently good that we could reproduce uh, some of the classical findings that I showed you. So for instance, if you ask, is there a group-wise difference in gaze to faces in these videos? So we annotated the faces and other features. And indeed you find that if you do it in the lab, if you do it with the Toby or if uh, participants take these pixel phones into their home and do it longitudinally across multiple sessions and then they just upload the data, you, rep you, you basically reproduce uh, these established group differences that autistic participants look like less at faces. And uh, this just shows the, uh, the same kinds of plots that I showed you before. Each dot is a participant, aut autism in, in orange, controls in blue. And if you compare in lab, phone versus uh, the remote phone or the Toby eye tracker. These are all um, pretty, good, pretty good correlations in terms of gaze onto faces. If you bring somebody into the lab, they tend not to gaze at faces when they look at a, to look at a screen of a Toby. You give them the pixel phone, they go home and for 10 weeks, they look at videos, you find that they also don't look at faces 
uh, there. And so these are, again, trait-like differences we can pull out, and these are just correlations across, I think it was 10 weekly sessions of longitudinal eye tracking data. So the, the point here is to uh, not so much to reveal new findings, all of these just replicate what's already known, uh, but to show you what's possible with, uh, with using smartphones to collect eye tracking data, you can do it in large samples, you can do it longitudinally, and you can do it in, um, in underserved communities. So what we're gearing up to do now is to do it uh, from a different camera, which everybody has, and is most of the people watching this conference uh, are, uh, have on their, on their laptop, which is webcams. And uh, we're using this open source software WebGazer that uh, many people have used. It works fairly well, but the spatial resolution is not great and it, it varies. It depends on the particular computer you have. And of course, if it's in your home, we don't have control over the details. But nonetheless, we can get fairly good calibration quality and we can get very large samples that way. So we can go into MTurk or Prolific. We can ask you know, 5,000 participants to participate in an eye tracking study. And then we can give them questionnaires, like the SRS or the AQ, or we can ask them and get some measure of autism, uh, at least as a continuous variable there as well. The, the problem is, or one challenge is that the quality of the eye tracking varies a lot for the reasons I just mentioned. And so as, as shown here, depending on where you set your threshold between initial um, calibration and, and subsequent validation, you, we, we typically exclude 30 to 50% of our participants. So that's a huge number. And of course you might, you would worry, we, we do worry about that introducing a bias. So if it's the case that people with autism tend to move more and give poorer calibration, well then you're, you're gonna build in a huge bias there. So we have to continuously adjust uh, this, um, this criterion to see if it has an effect on the results. Uh, but here are the basic uh, findings. So this I already showed you before, this is from a Toby eye tracker. Uh, and this is you know, autism versus controls, uh, where I showed you before that there are these stable trait-like differences. If you look at faces a lot, or these are just heat map correlations in one video that correlates well with a different, with a second video in a different session. Sta temporally stable trait-like um, gaze preferences. We find the same thing using WebGazer. So these are now data from the internet from uh, 180 subjects. Um, that participated in this. And these are all of them. These are just the high calibration quality. It turns out even if we have all of them in there, including ones with poor calibration quality, we find a fairly good, fairly strong correlation. So if we show them one clip on one day, we show them another clip on another day, we find uh, a strong trait-like temporally stable um, patterns here. So this, uh, this makes us think that this will work and we're gearing up to, to, uh, to do this. The typical distribution um, on if we if we recruit from prolific uh, looks something like this. So here, prolific, for example, I think MTurk doesn't do this, um, provides you uh, with um, some measure of whether the person self-reports autism, a, a, a diagnosis of autism. It's maybe two thousand or three thousand participants in the in the total prolific database. But so that's that's what's coded here with color, and then all participants get these questionnaires as well, the autism quotient and the um, social, resp social responsiveness scale. And you can see that there's, there's a good correlation between these two, which is reassuring. And there's a lot of scatter in here. So some people with an autism diagnosis actually score fairly low and some individuals who do not have an autism diagnosis score fairly high, but that's to be expected because you actually have, have a, big, a big spectrum and overlap. But just to give you a sense for, for how that looks. So th this is basically the end of the, of the talk here. We haven't done this yet. We're gearing up to do this in the next six months or so. Uh, we feel we have all the sort of infrastructure in place and we want to test about 5,000 or so participants uh, through prolific. And then also a large number, and I'm not sure quite how many, through the Simons Foundation's own uh, Spark database, which is a database of participants of, of people that have all been genotyped. Uh, they all have uh, uh, they all have, all have polymorphisms in genes that are at risk factors for autism. Uh, but so the, the questions are, how do we sample uh, this? Well, I already mentioned to you that the exclusionary criteria for data quality will probably build in a bias. So we have to adjust that and see what the effect is. Uh, what other tasks or questionnaires should we put in there? Uh, so we want to 
assess individual differences as richly as possible, but of course there's a time limit in terms of what people will fill out. But in addition to SRS and Q, we put in both a lot of other state and trade variables, the NEO, uh, you know, uh, back depression inventory and so forth. Number three is what stimuli to show. And again, if we haven't started this yet, if any of you have ideas or interest in collaborating, please let me know. Right now, what we've done is created a bunch of Zoom stimuli. So there's Zooms where there's four quadrants because it makes it easy to quantify where people look. And we have uh, actors that are in these Zooms where we experimentally manipulate specific factors that we want to test, like making direct, eye con making direct contact to the camera, which may look weird, um, who's speaking or not, et cetera. Um, so let me know if, if any, any of you are interested. Again, we're, yeah, the promise is there. I think we can get uh, good quality eye tracking data in very large samples. We can do so longitudinally. And what we've been kicking around the lab now is, you know, with this big investment, uh, what do we want to do exactly? And we're not quite there yet. Let me close with the last slide here. It's not, not specifically about, about uh, eye tracking at all, but just generally to, to close with, you know, some, some thoughts about neuroscience in the everyday world. So we have measures like FNIRs, and we have lots of behavioral measures, which could be videos of people's movements, or it could be performance tasks, or it could be filling out questionnaires. And I think, you know, there, there, there are a couple of, uh, of objectives that you could apply to this. One simple one that is perhaps the place to start is, can we just predict something about behavior from, from the brain data, or from eye tracking data? And you've heard a lot about that. Um, and the answer is yes, you can do that. Uh, the problem is that if you do it well, you often get something that's not easily interpretable. So it doesn't help to explain what's going on. It just says, collect all the data you can, you know, EEG, FNIRS, eye tracking, everything, and throw it together into some big AI model. And if you have enough data, you will be able to predict a lot about a person. Will that help to understand what's going on at the neural or the psychological level? And, and that's, I think, where the tension, the challenge is. And one reason, uh, one thought about moving forward is to um, use, use these data, use the eye tracking data, use the brain data uh, to revise not just the, uh, the DSM, but it, everything that we think about psychology. The reason people can understand the DSM and can understand psychology in terms, you know, like attention and memory, personality, is because it's essentially continuous with folk psychology and people invented these terms, they make sense, but they may not be the right way to, to map these two onto one another. So I think one big challenge with respect to this meeting is, can we come up with a different, uh, a different psychological vocabulary, different set of psychological variables that would help to bridge this gap between uh, what we're measuring and what we wanna explain in people's behavior. Thanks. Thank you very much. And again, roughly 10 minutes for questions from the audience. Uh, you have a category. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Um, in this slide, uh, you have categorized ASD as one group, but there are heterogeneity in the group. And uh, did, did you find any differences in the types of ASD? Or yeah, most of our work has been in, indeed just using the you know a, a DSM uh, plus ADOS kind of mm -hmm. classification, just groups, um, autism it. versus mm -hmm. not. But then uh, we have also looked either at ADOS severity scores within the autism group, which just sort of quantify parameterizes mm -hmm. the autism severity, and then across all of them, we've looked at these continuous measures like the autism quotient or the SRS. Um, and the, the rough story is that those, if you use regression rather than just classification, you, you, do, see, you do see continuous oh, see. parametric effects as well. With the caveat that, again, it's not clear these are the right scales. You can decompose these scales, for instance, to factors. So it gets very complicated and it gets, uh, it gets a bit dangerous if you don't you know, pre-register the study. Let's put it that way. There's lots of variables, lots of ways of looking at this. Thank but but the quick answer to your question is yes. In addition to just standard classification, if we pose this as a regression model with say SRS or some continuous measure, 
uh, if we find similar kinds of effects. Those people with the highest SRS scores also look at eyes the least, for example. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, thank you for a great talk. We, uh, in our lab, we also have attempted web gazer uh, in studying children with autism. And uh, uh, what we found is that uh, if we are recording uh, the session at their homes rather than uh, in the lab, uh, the uh, automated uh, coordinates uh, recognized by WebGazer are not very reliable. Like what you said, you had to exclude 30 to 50 percent of the participants. So uh, I'm wondering, uh, for pediatric populations. Uh, on the spectrum, do you have any suggestions in using these automated tools? Uh, yeah, so we, we've spent a lot of time, you know, looking at all the factors that, that um, affect data quality. Some are easier to control than others. So some are just like the operating system, the computer and, and so forth. So, but you can give, you can get that information. You can give people instructions yeah. not to have lots of stuff running in the background. Um, the other ones are instructions to the participants. And so in your case, it would be instruct the, the parents to hold the child still, right? Um, so we have people sit you know, in, a, in a chair, lean against a wall, and we come up with, uh, came up with various instructions mm -hmm. that improve data quality. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, there's a whole bunch of variables and we've tried to sort of get a handle on all of them. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, it's still the case that data quality, you know, calibration quality is gonna have a big range and you need to decide what threshold to use. And I think the only way to uh, test to what extent that biases your sample is to make that threshold variable and see what yeah. the effect is. But, but the quick answer is come up, you know, you have, to, you have to test it and see what the effect is. Come up with a set of instructions that mothers can actually implement at home. Yeah that would uh, hold the child yeah. uh, in a better position. And I also would love to talk more later about the kind of stimuli uh, used in these uh, experiments, because uh, webcam uh, may not be um, providing us uh, good spatial resolution as we would like in order to see right. where in the where in the screen they are looking at. So, yeah, like I said, we've, yeah. I mean, we are using feature-based eye tracking with yeah. videos, but the resolution is really bad for that, certainly if the features are small, like distinguishing eyes from mouth and a face. Yes. And so to have more control, we have, you, you could argue it's it's probably a naturalistic stimuli nowadays, right? We have a zoom, a zoom screen and four quadrants, and that works pretty well. Yeah. And then we can build in, these are actors, and there's a video, um, and we can build in the, the experimental factors that we want, but at the expense of, it's not quite like the real world anymore. I mean, that's always the trade-off. Thank you. Uh, hi, great talk. Thank you. My question is also regarding the stimulus, and uh, I think it's a good idea to go for moving faces. That's one, and then a quadrant that also uh, limits, you know, which quadrant you're looking at. But what I'm curious about is, uh, what do you do about the actual content? Is it pre-recorded in some way, or yes. is, or is it in response? No, like it's all, you, so far, it's all pre-recorded. Okay, because so naturalistic stimuli would be in response. A, a, right, right. Yes. So it, it's what I was just saying to the, to the previous person. Yes. I mean, we would like to go to, to truly interactive, uh, but then you sacrifice experimental control to some extent. And so, so far, everything is uh, same thing for the fMRI. It's all videos, movies recorded. It's fixed across subjects. So we have exactly the same. And it, typically the movies we pick are ones that people have already annotated the hell out of um, and, and used in fMRI studies, you know, Forrest Gump, Grand Budapest Hotel, et, et cetera. Great, I'd be happy to collaborate too, by the way. Yep, that'd be great. Oh, <clears throat> fascinating talk. Uh, so I'm wondering, you made this really interesting distinction between prediction and explanation at, towards the end of your talk. And, you know, in a sort of prediction paradigm, let's say we're talking about classification, most uh, supervised paradigms require a good label. So you have to label your training sample so that the classifier can learn from that. Uh, in the context of your talk and also Alan's, one of the interesting challenges is that the labels themselves are very challenging to come up with in, in some cases, like for example, in diagnostics. Right. Do you have any thoughts about how to get around that problem or ways forward? Well, I think just to be as comprehensive as possible, you know, so to, to kind of work towards something interpretable, you just want a, an encoding model that's, you know, very rich and has as many features as possible. 
and so typically for all of the well certainly for the for, for for the videos it's everything it's you know low level pixel saliency maps contrast color all the different channels lots of all the objects and all of that's automatable so it's pretty fast and then a whole bunch of semantic ones that you have to farm out to mturkers or so forth depending um, and the sound um, and then you can have you know complex sort of higher order ones uh, from that as well but basically yeah, you, you know you just set up in effect a very large regularized linear regression model with all these different regressors and encoding model and then you do, then you can back up the weights of the features from that and then once you have it's you know it goes on right and once you have that you work your way towards ultimately a, an explanation of you know a, a mechanistic model which is ultimately a causal model so i can say you know seeing eyes in the person when they have joint attention somewhere you know causes people to look somewhere else or whatever okay <clears throat> then we thank you once again and move on to the next talk